that you know ought to be the ideal of teaching anyway whether it's children or graduate students uh, they should be taught to challenge and to question images that come from the enlightenment about this that say that teaching should not be like pouring water into a vessel it should be like uh, laying out a string along which the student travels in his or her own way and maybe even questioning whether the string's in the right place. The second analogy Noam Chomsky uses here, which itself was originally used by the Enlightenment philosopher Wilhelm von Humboldt, provides us with a fitting introduction to Lucy Green's pedagogical method of informal learning. What Green set out to do was bring the learning practices of popular musicians into the classroom. Because while there had been striking changes made to the kinds of content taught in music classes, very little had actually changed in the way music was taught. Popular music had made its entrance on the scene, but it was still being taught with the rigid formality of yesteryear. What remained fixed, really, was music pedagogy itself, relying as it always had upon a teacher-student paradigm and structured regression. Informal learning loosens this traditional hierarchy. Students are given autonomy to not only engage in music they themselves enjoy, but also direct their own learning without explicit instruction from a teacher. They are also encouraged to learn popular music in the same way popular musicians learn, through listening, trial and error, and through doing. To borrow from Chomsky's analogy, informal learning practices provide the stream along which students idiosyncratically explore their own musicality. By building on past practices in music education, Green proposes a pedagogical method which incorporates all the innovations of the past, from the music appreciation movement of the 20th century, to the creative music movement explored in last week's video, to the popular music and world music movements of the 1970s onwards. Not the type to throw the baby out with the bathwater, she also emphasises the complementary nature of informal learning maintaining that it can be used just as meaningfully alongside formal learning practices. And while there are many practical advantages to informal learning, these are not the only reasons why Green advocates for such an approach. In fact, the principles of informal learning represent another decisive move in music education towards challenging the existing epistemology and practices of the discipline. Green questions many of the assumptions upon which formal music education is based. The challenge this posed, she wrote, included closing the gap between high and low musical cultures, between Western and non-Western musics, and has involved recognising and valuing pupils' own musical cultures by bringing them into the curriculum. Informal learning consists of five principles. Students learn music they themselves choose. They learn through listening and copying a recording. They learn with each other and without the teacher. And they learn in an unstructured way that often tends to be idiosyncratic or haphazard. Lastly, similar to Christopher Small's concept of musicking, this learning involves a synthesis of listening, performing, and composing or improvising. This pedagogical approach where students learn in much the same way as popular musicians, has as its basis a plenitude of purported benefits. By letting students choose their own music, it increases motivation and caters more inclusively to students from a range of backgrounds and musical abilities. It also encourages students to delve into music more holistically. And this, in turn, promotes the development of each student's critical musicality. This kind of musicality, Green explains, leads pupils out into unfamiliar territory, while also making them more aware of what they do already know and can already do. 
Formal music training relies upon the successful reproduction of the teacher's skills and knowledge in their student. Emile Durkheim, a French sociologist, describes the situation. Tomorrow's teacher can only repeat the gestures of his teacher of yesterday, and since the latter was merely imitating his own teacher, it is not clear how any novelty can find its way into this unbroken chain of self-reproducing models. While one may make the argument that students are simply reproducing the track they are copying, and so doing the very thing Durkheim outlines, it may be that the effect of student autonomy and the oral nature of learning ameliorates these reproductive effects. As Green notes, students learning music informally draw from a wide range of music which, rather than forcing them into a particular style, allows them considerable breadth when it comes to interpretation and technique. The use of informal learning practices that come from outside the classroom represents a positive move forward in music education. And while it does not try to provide a replacement for formal practices, it does get us closer to the kind of pedagogy John Dewey was talking about when he said, give the pupils something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. Learning naturally results.